architect should know what constitutes normal so that when you're working up the patient, you know what's normal so that if it doesn't fall within the tight definition of normal, you punt to the doctor and the doctor diagnoses. So a real cautious approach to take when you're working up your patients is to look for normal rather than look for abnormal. Normal for pupils is that they constrict equally. They are within a millimeter in size of one another in ambient light and hippus is normal. Hippus is a bilateral symmetrical unrest in the size of the pupils under steady illumination. It's a normal reflex which diminishes as we age. So it's more prominent in younger people. So now I'm gonna demonstrate what hippus is. Abby, who is my patient, is young. She's in her early 20s. And hippus is a normal reflex which diminishes as we age. And what it is is it's kind of a bouncy pupil and it happens under steady illumination. So in a patient who has hippus, we're gonna watch the pupil constrict briskly when we put a light on it, relax, and then you'll see the state of unrest known as hippus. It's a bilateral symmetrical unrest in the size of the pupil under steady illumination. And so let's go ahead and see that here. Watch Abby's pupils. It constricts, it relaxes, and then you'll see this variation in size. Do you see her pupils varying in the amount of dilation? They're dilating and constricting. That is hippus. And, and let's look at her other eye because it'll be bilateral. So let's look at her other eye. You'll see it do the same thing. It constricts, it relaxes, and then it's kind of bouncy in size. It gets larger and smaller under steady elimination. So a lot of texts get hippus and an afferent pupillary defect mixed up, and there's an important, there's two important differences between an APD and a hippus. The hippus is going to be bilateral, so it'll be in both eyes, and an APD will be only in one eye. The other important difference is that a hippus constricts first and then relaxes whereas an APD just dilates first. It does not constrict first. So what's not normal for pupils? More than a millimeter difference in size, not normal. Out of round, not normal. If during the swinging flashlight test, you see initial dilation when you swing over to a pupil, that is not normal. If your pupils respond differently to one another, either during the direct light response testing or the consensual light response testing, that is not normal. This is a salient point. Pupil assessment is a comparative test. You're comparing the relative strengths of signals in one eye versus the other. Therefore, if everything is normal in both eyes, you're gonna see the exact same thing in both eyes. So you're looking for symmetry when you check pupils. If you see anything that is not symmetrical, that's a red flag. Have the patient fixate on a distant, non-accommodative fixation target. Dim your room lights. You must use a bright test light and you must have a pupil gauge. The reason we have our patient look at a distant, non-accommodative fixation target is because of something called the near reflex triad. These are three things that happen automatically when you look at something up close. First of all, your lens accommodates. That's the crystalline lens inside your eye. It changes shape to bring things into focus. Also, your eyes converge. That means that they come towards one another. And the third part of the near reflex triad is pupillary constriction. It's this last component of the near reflex triad, which is why we have to give them a distant, non-accommodative fixation target when we check pupils. If they don't look at a non-accommodative distant target, we're gonna start off with pupils that are already constricted due to the near reflex. Why make our jobs harder than they have to be, right? One of the ways we make pupil assessment easier is by starting off with the largest pupil that we can. 
And the way we do that is by using a darkened room and a non-accommodating distant fixation target. This will get you the briskest response possible. Anisocoria means the patient has more than a millimeter difference in size between their two pupils in ambient light. Now you might see the phrase across the top of the slide here that says ants on the cornea. I have a funny story about that. Early in my career we were on call and one of our technicians was scribing and she came out from the room and she told all of us techs in the tech station there's a patient in room two with ants on their cornea. And we were all befuddled trying to figure out how in the world that could happen. And pretty soon the doctor came out and we said, Doc, what's up with that patient who has ants on their cornea? And the doctor looked at us like we were crazy. She said, ants on the cornea? That patient has anisocoria. The doctor had dictated to the scribe anisocoria and the technician, who didn't know what that was, wrote under cornea, ants on the cornea. So of course we all got a big kick out of that. But it's not ants on the cornea, it's anisocoria. So this is a difference in the size of the two pupils of more than one millimeter in ambient lighting conditions. Let's talk about some conditions that can cause anisocoria. Horner's syndrome can be acquired or congenital. Congenital is benign. So there's no disease process going on. Acquired is not benign. There is a disease process going on. And it's very important to never miss a Horner syndrome. What you'll see in a Horner syndrome is you'll see an anisocoria. You'll see a totic lid on the side with the smaller pupil. And their anisocoria will be greater in dim light. They'll have less of an anisocoria with the lights on. Whenever you see an anisocoria, you should always measure the pupils with the lights on and the lights off and document it on the chart. Acquired Horner syndrome can be caused by lung cancer, carotid artery aneurysms, neck or chest trauma or surgery, and it's very important to never miss a Horner syndrome. So again, they will have an anisocoria, and the smaller pupil will have a totic lid. They may also not have sweating on the side of their face with the totic lid. Congenital Horner syndrome will have a totic lid on the side with the smaller pupil. They'll have an anisocoria, and additionally, they'll have a heterochromia, meaning they'll have two different color irises. Typically, the lighter colored iris is on the side with the totic lid and the small pupil. Third cranial nerve palsy has an anisocoria greater with the bright lights on. So they'll have less of an anisocoria with dim lights. They'll have a totic lid on the side with the larger pupil. Now the pupil is not always involved on a third cranial nerve palsy. Diabetic third cranial nerve palsies usually will not have pupil involvement. If the pupil is involved though, typically the pupil will be mid dilated, five to six millimeters. They also may have a dysmotility. Typically their eye will be deviated down and out. An 80s tonic pupil will have a large anisocoria like the picture here, but they will not have a totic lid. If you see an anisocoria and no lid ptosis, you should think 80s tonic pupil. Siderosis bulbi is where the patient has a retained iron foreign body and it rusts in their eye. It can cause an anisocoria as well as a heterochromia. The eye with the retained iron foreign body typically will have a, a darker colored iris. Trauma can cause anisocoria as can pharmacologic agents, myadriatics, myotics, cycloplegics, and illicit drugs. And then finally, there's physiologic anisocoria, which means that that's just the way that they were born. If you see an anisocoria, measure and document the pupil size both in dark and in light. You'll document these on the chart as scotopic, 
which is in the dark, and photopic size pupils, which is in the light. The reason this is important to do is it helps the physician differentiate a patient who has congenital anisocoria, meaning that there's no disease process going on and they were just born that way, versus a pathologic condition. Patients who have an anisocoria due to some disease will typically have a differing amount of anisocoria with the lights on versus the lights off. If the patient has an anisocoria, make note of the lid position and the iris color. This is because atotic lid can be present in patients with Horner syndrome and third cranial nerve palsies. Also, heterochromia can be present if a patient has congenital Horner syndrome. Irregularly shaped pupils can be caused by surgery, synechia, and trauma. Synechia occurs when there's intraocular inflammation. The iris becomes adherent to the anterior lens or the posterior cornea.